Well, good morning, and it's good to be back uh, with you guys today. Uh, we're going to be kind of picking up a series that we left off of a few weeks ago uh, to kind of go over Thanksgiving, and um, that was the You Asked For It series, and uh, I think this is at least week six or seven in that series. I can't remember my numbering system in my computer is a little off, and so I, I think it may be number seven, uh, but this whole sermon series has been really fueled by your questions, by by, by your uh, curiosities, if you will, about what God's Word teaches on all sorts of different things. And, and I do want to encourage you, um, if you haven't been here for these series, uh, to, to go back on our website, check it out, because uh, you're going to see, I think, some great content there of how God uh, answers so many of the questions that we have. You know, I think sometimes it, it's kind of a cop-out if we're not careful when we look into the Word of God. We're going, man, it's just, it's just so hard to understand, and so we just kind of throw our hands up and just say we're just not going to understand any of it. Uh, but the reality is that so many of the questions that we have about life, so many of the questions that you have about uh, not, not just life, but about relationships, about church, about the creation, about the end times, all these things are talked about in the Word of God. You just have to dig and get them out. And today we're going to be talking about one of the most uh, debated and curiosity, maybe laden things that there is in all of the scriptures, and that is the second coming of Christ. And it really, that, that's what we're going to be talking about. There was a couple of questions specifically related to this idea of the end times, and, and, and the questions were, thi- were this. Uh, one was this, um, do you go to meet Jesus when you die, or is that later on? Is it something that, that happens later on? And and number two was, does everyone go to judgment, um, even Christians? Do they have to stand before God in judgment one day? And like all the other questions, what we're not going to be doing is answering them super specifically, but giving you really the, the general idea of what Scripture teaches about that concept, about that particular area, uh, and really focusing on what God really wants to communicate to us. And hopefully today will be an area that you will find extremely useful but it may not answer these questions exactly today. But I'm going to kind of give you a little preview of that answer real quick before we kind of move on to the main topic, okay, that we're going to be talking about. Question number one, what, is, what happens to someone when they die? Well, we know from multiple passages in the Scriptures that uh, what makes you and, me, you and me is not our flesh and our bones, right? I mean, the reality is, is it doesn't take long to realize when you start talking to people and observing the world and observing how all this stuff works, that there's more to humanity uh, than meets the eye. We're not just a a, a bunch of cells clumped together that that are here for a while and gone and go back to dust, but we are created beings with a spirit, with a soul. And, And that's what really differentiates us from all the rest of creation is the soul that God puts in to every single person that he's ever created. And because of that, uh, it helps us understand some of the passages when it seems like, well, I thought we, were, I thought we died and went to heaven, but, but there we are, right there, you know, in the ground. I wasn't even going to share this story. And I made a pact with myself last week. I was not going to go off script. But I'm going to go off script, okay? When my kiddos, and this is not to be too funny, but it's just an observation, I think, I think of what we struggle with. Um, I was, uh, being a pastor, you go to a lot of funerals, you go to a lot of uh, memorial services and things like that, and, and I've always tried to keep my kids from having to do all the duties with dad that I have to do, because I just feel like, man, there's just so much to take on for a child. I mean, there's times I don't even want to go do it, right? And, and so my kids, though, I really couldn't do anything else with them, and so Julie and I, we really needed to make this particular service, and it was a visitation for someone, and I believe it was... I think it was Caleb. It may have been Joshua. I don't remember which one now. Julie can, correct, can remind me later. But we're, uh, we're going in, and, and they know that this person had been in our church that had passed away. And uh, we're getting ready to go to the funeral. We're kind of preparing them. Hey, guys, I just want you, I mean, the visitation. Hey, I just want you to know we got to go by here. Well, why? Well, you know, Miss So-and-so, she passed away. And we're just going to go talk to her family and encourage them. Well, what happened to her? Well, you know, she died, but, but, but now she's in heaven. Okay. All right. That, so far, so good until you get to the funeral home. And we're sitting there with our kids, and we're trying to keep them in this other room in the foyer. You're like, hey, y'all just hang out right here, buddy. We'll be right back, you know. Unfortunately, the door opened to the visitation site, and you could got a straight view to Miss So-and-so. I don't remember who it was now. And what does the preacher's kid do? 
Daddy, Daddy, she's not dead. She's right there. Because there's a natural confusion. Well, I thought she was in heaven. Why is she there? Well, here's what we understand. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. There's this reality that we have to understand. There's a dichotomy within us that there are that we have the physical body, we have the, the, the thing that people see and can touch and can feel, but then there's our soul that, that lasts for all eternity. And, and it's to when we are absent from our body, when we die, our soul, if we are believers in Jesus Christ, is in the presence of God. But our bodies remain in the ground until the rapture, okay? And that's another discussion we can have. But, but so we understand that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. If you look at Jesus, when he was on the cross and the thief, there were two thieves beside him, and one of them was cursing and hurling insults, and the other uh, begins to defend Jesus, and, and evidence is some type of faith right there. And Jesus, what did they say? Today, you will be with me in paradise. And, and scholars and people smarter than me have written for years trying to figure out, well, is he saying, hey, today I tell you? Like, hey, I'm telling you right now? Or is he saying, hey, today's the day that when you breathe your last breath, you're going to have eternity in my presence because of your faith today. I, I believe it's the latter. I really, truly do. And then we have the rich man and Lazarus. If you're familiar with that story, that there was a rich man who, who, who would ride in and out of the city gate, and Lazarus was a, a, a guy that was impoverished, and, and he, was just, he was poor, and he was sitting, and he would beg, and, and they both passed away. And Jesus tells the story of uh, the rich man looking up from hell and seeing Lazarus and remembering him. And asking him, can you send Lazarus to dip his finger in cool water and cool my tongue? Can, can, you, can you send me some relief? Uh, so there's evidence that, that we're not waiting for someday, one day, to be in the presence of God. But yes, when we die as believers in Jesus Christ, we can have confidence that we are ushered into the presence of God. I think there's plenty of evidence in the Scriptures. That's, that's one question. The second one's this, and, and then we're going to move on. Does everyone face judgment? And, and if you look at the Scriptures, you're going to see uh, different people have different ideas. Uh, you have people that talk about the great white throne judgment, and is that for believers or just unbelievers. You have people talk about the judgment seat of Christ where it seems like believers come and, and rewards are given. And, and, and you have people believing there's a third judgment where there's sheep and there's goats and nations are divvied up. I'm going to tell you this, we're not going to get into all that right now because the question was, does everyone stand before and give an account of God for their life? And the answer is yes. We're not measured all the same way, but we are all going to stand before God one day and give an account for the life that we lived while we were here. Everyone will stand before God one day, and every knee and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. I want to really reiterate that. It doesn't matter if you are telling me right now, Chris, I will never bow to God. You don't know what happened in my life. I'm never going to humble myself. I'm never going to tell him that he's anything worth anything. I've heard people with that kind of rebellion. I'm going to tell you right now, you're either going to bow here or you're going to bow there, but every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess there will be a day that there will leave no doubt that Jesus is Lord and everyone that's ever lived is going to come to that knowledge at some point. You just want to be on this side of eternity and judgment when you come to that realization because when you come to it then, it is too late. So people will face judgment. And I remember being a kid and I would hear things like Chris was talking about Jesus coming back I mean, when it sounds really, really kind of, kind of sweet right now when Chris says it because life's hard. But man, when you're younger and you're a kid, you're like, man, I know I want Jesus to come back, but not right now. I've got so much to do. And the older you get, it seems like the more sweet that sound becomes. And here's why I believe that to be true. It's not because you're just ready to meet him because you have to say it because you know you're closer to the grave than away. I think you say it because you realize, man, this life is hard. Even at its best, this life brings pain and heartache and grief and aches and your joints don't move like they used to. Sometimes they've got to put new ones in, right? 
I mean, I'm telling you right now, I'm thinking I'm just going to get me some ports for some WD-40 in my back, right? My elbow, I got an injection this week. Anybody got an injection in their joint lately? I'm going to tell you what. I've done plenty of them. I've never had much compassion because I'm like, it's not a big deal. Let me tell you, next time we're going to pray before I start shooting people's joints up. <laughs> Woo! Let me tell you, he shot that in there and I was like, amazing grace. And, and you can't look like it's hurting you because you're a medical field. This is your colleague you're working with. And he's like sticking it in there and they're like, are you okay? I'm like, yeah. <sighs> and then it got bad. He did it the other direction. And when he did that, y'all, there was another level. I teared up a little. The nurse I worked with looked at me and kind of smiled and said, that one you felt, didn't you? It's like, yes, I did. Felt it all the way to my toes. Getting older makes heaven look a lot sweeter. Going through difficult times makes heaven look a lot sweeter. But I remember when I was younger especially, and even now sometimes, I look at my kids the age they are now, and I think, man, I want to watch my kids grow up more. I want to, I want to see them as parents. I want, I want to see them, you know, do the things they said I should have never done, right? I want to see them when their, their kids grind Skittles and Kit Kats into their backseat of their new car. I want to watch that. I can't wait. I want to watch their kid, like, push the rack down. This is literally happened. It bells. And I want to watch them chase it while it dominoes down the entire store. And you catch it 12 racks later. I counted. I want to watch that. And when I would, when I would hear things about Jesus coming back, and, and it sounds sweet, but at the same time, I'm going to be honest with you all. I don't, I'm like, I don't know if I want that yet. That bothers me because I think I'm supposed to. I think I'm supposed to desire the coming of Christ. Because when I look at the Scriptures, I look at the New Testament, I look at all these apostles who lived and walked with Jesus. Man, they seemed excited about it. It's like they had an understanding of Jesus that, that was like, they just got, they got it. That the life after is far better than the life here. And that the life here is so temporary. And the life there is so permanent. And that it is sweet and to be enjoyed and anticipated. But I don't always have that, if I'm honest with you. And I wonder about in this room if there's some people out there who say, you know what, Chris, I'm, I'm not sure I'm looking forward to it either. And maybe your reasons are different than, than mine sometimes. I think some of us in this room, we get scared when we hear that. And it's not because we just want to look forward to the life. Some, some of us aren't really sure that we're ready to meet him. Maybe some of us in this room have heard the gospel, the message of Jesus Christ over and over and over, but we've never actually acted on it. And we've never actually come to a place where we said, God, I know that I'm a sinner. And I know that I am without hope. And I know the only way to eternal life is through Jesus Christ. And so, God, I want to give my life to him. I want you to please forgive me of my sins. You are Lord, and you are Savior of my life. And I give everything I have to you. God, I'm yours. And we know we've never done that, and so it terrifies us to think about him coming back. There's some of us, maybe we're Christians, but we are so wrapped up in this world that we really don't want him to come back because we don't want to have to explain what we've been doing. I'll be honest, that's, that's how I came into the ministry. I was sitting there studying one day, studying the Scriptures, and this, this question, if, if you were to die right now and have to meet the Lord, would you be ready? I had been saved for a decade at that point, or more, I guess, a little more. But I honestly had to say, you know what, I'm not ready. And you know why I'm not ready? Because I know God is calling me to do more than what I am doing. And I don't want to meet God in a state of disobedience. I want to meet him fully surrendered and fully devoted and at work doing the ministry he's called me to do. That's how I want to meet him. I want well done, good and faithful service, uh, good and faithful servant. Not what you've been doing, knucklehead. I don't want that. I, I, I don't think that one's in there. But I don't want that. 
So, so what can we, how, how can we be ready? How can we really be ready for when Jesus returns? Well, there's some things we need to know about his return that I think are going to help us. Because here, at the end of the day, no matter when Jesus comes, how Jesus comes, if it's before this or after that, or whatever you want to talk about theologically, I think everyone can pretty much agree that there's a day of judgment coming, there's a day of reckoning coming, and we're either going to die before he gets here or we're going to be alive when he gets here, but we're going to face him one way or the other. And so I want to be ready. And, and what I want to make sure of today is that when I preach today, that there's no doubt on how you can be ready too. But there's some things we need to know about that day if we're going to be ready. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus has been talking about the end of the age to his disciples. He talks about what it's going to look like and kind of gives them some things to consider and to look for in that day to kind of understand what's coming up. So that they don't lose heart because if you watch the news very long and you don't know this part of the story of this gospel, you will get sad very quickly. If all I had was CNN or Fox or you know, whatever, MSNBC, if that's all the information I had about the condition of this world, I would be depressed. But you see, I don't just have that. I have the story right here of the why and the how and the what's going on so that when I turn on the news, I'm never surprised because I realize it's all coming to an end and that God's truly in charge. And so Jesus is explaining the condition that the world's going to be in and what people can expect. And then he says this in verse 36 about the day. He says, but about that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That's how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding with a handmill. One will be taken and the other left. And then he goes on and he just says, you know what, keep watch. Therefore, keep watch. Make sure that you're ready. Make sure that you're prepared. Make sure that you're anticipating this day because you don't know when it's going to happen. It's, gonna, it's just going to be like the, in the days of Noah. And you're not going to expect it. And when it comes, you need to make sure that you're ready, that you're anticipating, that you're preparing for it. So, so there's three truths that we really need to know if we're going to prepare for the second coming. And, and here's number one. The day of Christ's return will be unknown. So be ready. You're not going to have this advanced warning system that tells you, by the way, March 24th, 2024, the day is coming. Hey, y'all, y'all, the next time this particular comet circles the, you know, the, the galaxy and comes around, that's the day. Hey, guess what? This tribe, this civilization back thousands of years ago has this, has this calendar that looks like a big Oreo. And you're going to be able to read it and determine the end of the day, age. Maybe they just lost the other side of the Oreo. We have no clue. I'm talking about the Mayan calendar, in case you're not caught up to speed on what I mean. But it seems like every few months, but certainly every few years, there's another epiphany that some group or some person has had that predicts the end of the age. Whether it's going to be a comet, or whether it's global warming, or whether it's a Mayan calendar, or whether it's a comet, like I said, a comet coming through, or, or whatever it might be, the, the coronavirus, it doesn't matter. I mean, it, there's always something coming down the pike, and there's more than enough people willing to jump on the bandwagon and say, that's the day. And what Jesus knows is that there's going to be a lot of that in this world. There was already that happening in his day and age. He's like, take heart. When you hear this kind of stuff, don't believe it. Don't buy into it. Nobody knows the day or the hour. Not even Jesus, the Son himself, knows it. So don't, don't buy into the hype that some Mayan knows that. Don't buy into the hype that some preacher who preaches it 
knows it. Don't buy into the hype that some scholar who predicts it can predict it because only God the Father knows it's unknown to everyone else. The angels don't know. The Son doesn't know. I guarantee you some televangelist in polyester suits spitting doesn't know. Do you hear me? I'm telling you because there's great danger in this world and you see it and I see it all the time of people who are spewing all this knowledge. And I can't tell you how many times people send me things. Hey, Pastor Chris, I'm concerned. What do you think about this? Hey, what about that? What about this over here? I'm going to tell you, if it predicts with any type of specificity the return of Christ, just toss it in the garbage. Because it's already built on the wrong premise. Because the scriptures say that no one knows. And I'm just going to go on a limb to say that if we're talking about the coming of the Son, and the Son saying that no one knows, that must be correct. It's so important because so many people live in fear. Let me tell you, believers, if you're a believer in this room, when you hear things like this and you hear the skeptics begin to howl and you hear the news begin to report and you see the threads on Facebook beginning to light up with all this, we should not fear. because We should recognize it as ignorance at best and delusion or maybe even sinister motives at worst. But it is not the work of God. And we should recognize it as such. So it's unknown, but the day of Christ, number two, I want you to hear another truth is it'll be routine. Look at verses 37 and 9. It says, For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. Up to the day Noah entered the ark. They knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That's how it'll be when the coming of the Son of Man. He's saying it's just like it's just not back when Noah was here. Now, now, I used to look at this and go, man, I'm, I'm really trying to fathom this because I remember hearing about Noah and how every man had evil in his heart just continually. And I used to get a pretty, pretty good peace of mind because I was like, oh, well, you know, I don't think everybody's just thinking evil stuff all the time. So maybe, maybe it's not right t- now. And then I read this passage and realized that's not at all what he's saying. Here's what Jesus is teaching. Just like in Noah's day, there's going to be people who Noah's over there building this big boat preaching about judgment. I mean, can you imagine? He's over there like hammering, repent, repent. And they're just like, just living life like nothing's going on. There's a 300-foot boat over here. like, And they're just living life, just like routine, just like nothing's happening. And it took him a while to build the boat. That's because just like the day of Noah... The day Christ's return will just be another day. It's just going to be routine to this world. There's not going to be some big advertisement on TV. There's not going to be some billboard somewhere that tells you, hey, get ready because on that particular day it's coming. He said it's just going to be a normal day for most everybody. People are going to wake up just like they woke up yesterday. They're going to punch the clock. They're going to go to work, and they're going to assume it's like any other day. They're going to live like tomorrow is guaranteed. And I'm going to tell you what, if that doesn't sound like our culture, I don't know what does. We live in a culture right now that there is literally almost no, no credence given to the idea that tomorrow may not come. And we're not just talking about people who don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I would say even in the church, if we're honest with ourselves, many of us live like tomorrow's guaranteed. And he says the day that Christ returns, I'm telling you, it's just going to be like when Noah was here and he was building that ark and and judgment's coming and he's preaching and you just keep walking around like nothing's going to happen. And I think that's really the most dangerous piece of this because the reality is when we live like tomorrow's guaranteed, we end up putting the most important things off till later. That, that's why if you've ever talked to a 20-year-old and tried to get them to think about investing money into a 401k, it's just laughable, right? I remember when I was 18 years old, I got a job working at Mother Francis Hospital in Tyler. Man, they were talking about all the benefits. I was like, health insurance? I don't get sick. He's like, hey, we have, this, we have this retirement plan. And I'm just like checked out drawing like cars on my paper because that's for old people. Like I've got a thousand years till I retire. I'm 18 years old. 
And they stress and they strain. And I remember them even saying, I know if you're young in here, you're just tuning us out right now, but we're trying to tell you there's a day a coming that you're going to need to be ready for. But when you're 18 years old, retirement seems like a long way off. At that point, I thought I would marry rich still. One of my coworkers actually told me that. He said, Chris, don't marry for love. Don't marry for looks. Those both go away. Marry for money. He had just gotten divorced from his wife, so I didn't put a lot of stock into his relationships, but still, that was my advice, literally from someone. Um, but the reality is, is when you talk to a 20-year-old, or you talk to a teenager, it's so hard, right? Because we think tomorrow is just naturally going to come. And when it comes to the return of Christ, we're just not guaranteed of what day that may be. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to flip that around even to say, when it just comes to life in general, if you haven't figured this out, tomorrow's not guaranteed. Even if Christ doesn't come meet you, you may very well go meet him. Every time that I preach just about, I think of this like, who in this room may not see tomorrow? We don't know. It may be me. Maybe you. But the funeral homes are full of people today who thought they were going to be here whoop, a couple of days ago. Had no clue what was coming. So be ready. You got to be ready because it'll just be like any other day, it'll be routine. And then lastly, the day of Christ's return will be divisive. Look at verses 41 and 41, uh, 40 and 41. He gives a picture. It says, two men will be in the field. And this, this points to the rapture of, the, uh, of, of the, those who are saved, okay, and those who are coming to Christ in the air. And it says, two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a handmill. One will be taken and the other left. Therefore, keep watch. What Jesus is trying to teach here is saying, look, when that day comes and that Christ begins to harvest his people, there's going to be a very clear line between the people of God and the people who have rejected him. And to me, this is one of the most the saddest pictures in all of Scripture. You know, when you talk about him dividing up sheep and goats, you know, you're like, well, I mean, being a goat's not that bad, maybe. But when you start looking at this, you're going, wait a second, I, I think I see what's happening. He's actually ushering in the end of this world. And at this moment, he's saying, that one's mine. That one's mine. That one's mine. And there's a harvest going on. The problem is, if you're not his, he doesn't just ignore you. You have a day coming too. And it's just too late to change it. It's too late to change your mind. Because the day of Christ's return will be a divisive time. There will be people who are taken and people who are left. The, this moment will be millions of people will literally just turn up missing in the world. And the world will begin to experience the incredible judgment of God. You don't want to be here for that. Doesn't matter if you're a, what we, this is some of you nerding out, you'll, you'll appreciate this, but it doesn't matter if you're pre tribulational, mid tribulation, or, or post. I think the, the agreed upon consensus would be nobody really wants to be here for these moments. We can debate the timing all we want, but the reality is, is there's a day of reckoning where the harvest is going to be taking place and there will be people that we know and we love and we care about who will not be harvested with God's people. And that breaks my heart. Can I be really honest with you? There are people in this room who won't be on the right side of this harvest. But it's not because God is not giving you an opportunity to. It'll be because you choose to. And believers in the room, I want to I challenge you with something. 
We've read this quote in this church before, but I want to read it one more time. Charles Spurgeon said this, If sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. And if they perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped about their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, let it be filled with the teeth of our exertions, and let not one go unwarned and unprayed for. Church, it is time that we get serious about the condition of this world. We, we, let's just be honest. I'm just going to be really honest as Chris and the musicians come up. I'm going to be really honest. I think if we're not careful, we can really get caught up in this trap of looking at all the bad things in the world. I mean, we just sit and we point fingers and talk about how bad the world is. We talk about how sick this world is and we talk about how, how broken this world is. But we don't do one thing to actually try to fix it. We just curse the darkness instead of being light in the darkness. This is convicting to me. Because as I think about this passage, I think about neighbors right now that probably don't know Christ. And honestly, I've probably had more conversations about their dog than I have about their souls. And I'm not trying to make you feel bad, but you probably should. Right? I mean, I'm not trying to make you feel bad. We probably all should feel bad. I don't know if any of us are really tearing it up here. I know I'm not. It's so easy to sit back. And you just, man, just the world is just so bad. People are just, you know, they're just so, they're just so evil. We were never commanded or called to curse the darkness. We were called and commanded to be light. To preach the good news to the brokenhearted. To help bind up the wounds. I am so glad someone saw fit to come to me in my darkness. Because regardless of whether you know it or not, we were all dark at one time. We were all broken. We were all without hope. It is only because God saw fit to put somebody into your life to share the good news of the gospel that you can sit here today and have hope when Christ returns. That's it. Are we going to be that person for others? That's the question today. I feel like there's people in this room that maybe you don't have that hope because you've never accepted Christ. Don't be like the people in Noah's day where the preacher's preaching, he's telling you, and you just go on like it's not coming. You will meet Jesus sometime. Guaranteed. Believers. We will give an account for our lives. We may be secure in our hope in the gospel, but that should be the starting point for a life devoted to following and serving the Lord. Man, that is not the end game for us. That is the starting point for a life devoted to be the salt and the light that this world desperately needs. We live in a dark world, and I'm going to tell you something right now. It's so easy in Fairfield, Texas, sometimes to get kind of tunnel vision and to feel like our little community is just different. We're isolated. You're just, it's bad. I'm telling you. And there's some people in this room that can tell you this. We've got the sheriff with us. This is a dark place too. There are dark things happening in this community. And we drive by it every day. What would it look like if everyone in this room said, you know what? I'm going to do everything I can to be the person that people are going to have to leap over my dead body if they want to go to hell. I will stand in the gap. I will be obedient. I will be the witness. That is what this world needs. That is what Fairfield needs. That is what Round Prairie needs. 
I'm telling you. You want to see this church explode on fire for the gospel of Jesus Christ? Just a few of us in this room catch fire with that vision and that command and that call. And I, I dare to say that we would see the doors blown off this place of what God would do. We've got to get serious with the call. There's three types of people in this room, and I want you to be able to answer this before you leave. One, you're an unbeliever and you're not prepared to meet Jesus. Second group, you're a believer, and man, you are on fire, and you're pursuing the things of God, and you're ready to meet Him. And the third group that I think, if we're honest, many of us may fall into I'm a believer and I'm a recipient of the incredible grace of God. But if I'm honest, I'm not ready to meet him. I'm not being obedient to what God's called me to do and to be in my life. I understand. I've I've been there. Currently there, I feel like, in some areas. What does God want from you? I hope, if nothing else, that we can all begin to get ready after today. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the power of it. Thank you, God, that you you give us the truth, even though it's hard. Thank you that, God, you've given us the life you have given us already. God, I'm sorry, and I believe I can speak for most everyone in this room, God, if, as I confess to you that, God, I've taken it for granted. I celebrate my salvation while I hoard it rather than share it with the world around me. God, I pray that you would begin to show me areas and relationships with the The gospel needs to be shared. Help us to come back to this place with stories of God, you doing mighty works in our neighborhoods and in our friend circles and in our workplaces as we just step out in obedience to you. Lord, if there's anyone here who doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, please do not let them out of this place without them turning their heart, their mind, their whole life over to you. That is the first step of being ready. Lord, we love you and we praise you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.